All right, here we are. Welcome back to Book Wave, the book club podcast. Today we're back for another wave cast. I'm your host, Scott, as usual, joined today by Pat. Yeah, yeah. Jason. Hey, thanks for tuning in, turning on, and dropping out of the mainstream. William. Hey. And our special guest today, Paul Vander Clay. Great to be here. And uh, I guess we'll start this conversation with with our guest. Why don't you just give us a quick little introduction of what you do on YouTube, what you do in your personal life, and how you became a superstar here on the on the internet. <laughs> became internet famous. Uh, my name is Paul Vanderclay. I'm the pastor of a small church in Sacramento, California. And I've I, before this, I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic. So I've got some overseas experience too. I was raised, my father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. I became internet famous by watching the work of Jordan Peterson. And I was actually, the video I released today gives a lot of that story about how I got into this because I'm starting to do some some work on some sort of turning towards the church. Okay, why the work that I've been doing I think is important for the church and Christianity. But I I was interested in the work of Jordan Peterson and I thought it was important and I wanted more conversation partners. And I thought that if I made a YouTube video or two that I might be able to get some new conversation partners. And I was not quite prepared for how many conversation partners I would get in this process <laughs> because I've gotten far more than I ever would have imagined I would have gotten. I was thinking maybe I would I had 15 subscribers on my YouTube channel, which is a little project between me and another member of my church. And I thought maybe I'd get 100 or 200 subscribers. And of that, there'd be you know a handful of people who want to talk about wonky, nerdy, geeky stuff about Jordan Peterson, but that didn't happen. And so a whole bunch of different things happened. The, uh, some local people, we started a local meetup, which has continued on to this day, uh, you know, kind of a core group of people who want to continue to meet together and talk about important things. Um, they eventually started the Bridges of Meaning Discord server, where we just hit the 2000 mark in terms of people who have joined that. Not all of them are active participants, obviously. Uh, the channel has continued to grow. It's not it's not a huge channel in terms of YouTube, but it's 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 big enough to provide me with an ongoing a lot of ongoing conversation partners and some good ministry. Um, a lot of for a number of people, I'm sort of their pastor if they don't have a church. Other people who do go to church, I'm another Christian that they can listen to. And for people who aren't Christians, I'm sort of a token Christian that they can maybe throw things at or ask questions of. So that's kind of how this thing has developed over the last three years. And I've tried as best as I can to integrate it into my regular church work, um, which is a little odd because nobody in my church really watches YouTube. So it's we're a small church and i don't know if we're going to make it through covid as a church so this is some really valid ministry that gives the people of my church a sense that they're reaching out far beyond our little local neighborhood so that's that's sort of what i do the um the living stones church which you mentioned that's yeah. a not you said it was a non-denominational no, we're part of the Christian Reformed Church of North America, which is a Dutch, uh, Dutch Calvinist denomination that started in the middle of the 19th century, mostly of Dutch immigrants. And yeah, so that's that's our that's our church background. And it's Living Stones Christian Reformed Church. It's the name of our church. We used to be Sacramento Christian Reformed Church, but then we planted a whole bunch of other Christian Reformed churches in Sacramento. So. I didn't really want to be first Christian Reformed Church, so we changed the name. I went to uh, your web page, uh, theleadingchurch.com. Is that still? That's my, that's my personal blog. Okay, on your personal blog, you write at the top, Gospel Word Gardening in the Age of Decay. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could uh, expand on uh, what this age of decay is from your perspective. The Bible tells time in two different ages. There's the present age and the age to come, or the new age. 
And the present age is one that's marked by decay, which means that any institution you build will break down. Anything that grows and has life will die. And that's the present age. Everything decays in this age. And so, oh, about 15 years ago, I was trying to find a way to communicate these concepts to my church. And so I just started talking about the age of decay. And that stuck with a lot of my members. They didn't much like it. But the point of the idea is to bring home the fact that nothing in this world lasts. And the Apostle Paul talks in terms like that. Um, I just sort of gave it a, a, a sharp little title. And then people in my church was like, oh, the age of decay, the age of decay, because they're all getting older and their bodies are breaking down and marriages fail and businesses <laughs> go bust. And that's the age of decay. And it's it's a it's kind of a shorthand way of 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 reminding us that this world is impermanent. That's a that's a far broader idea that and the Greeks had a very similar idea. They knew they, they knew everything in this world broke down, which is why. You know, with Platonism, everything up in the up in the heavens is permanent, and so you had this you had this two worlds mythology that developed in many different cultures. Stuff down here decays; stuff up there stays forever, and so you have all of these dualities that develop. So I I tried to find a little sermonic way of communicating it that people could identify with and remember. Yeah, I actually like that uh, how you are connecting the present. Um, and from like a, I'm not a Buddhist, um, you'll probably find that you're sitting here discussing with uh, a bunch of non-theist lads. But uh, in, in the Buddhist perspective, they say the present is kind of in line with that idea of decay. They use the word impermanence. And so everything passes. Like, And they say, we are the yellow leaf on a tree. And, and we live our life, you know, from a green leaf as a baby, we turn yellow and we fall to the ground and it's just, you know, impermanence. Yep. But we're also all interconnected through that impermanence because if nothing lasts, then we're all um, brought together by that realization. So part of how this works in Christianity is that, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, when the Apostle Paul talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he makes a big point of the fact that Jesus' new body does not decay. In other words, what, and, and in Christianity, our anticipated resurrection is in kind with his resurrection that happened, and so we are raised to no longer decay. And so that's where you have this you have the present age, sometimes it's called the present evil age, and then we have the age to come, and in that age to come, the, the permanence that our hearts instinctively long for is realized. And, and the reason that Christians have hope of that is because, and then Christians often will talk about, uh, we have entered the... Um, we have entered the last days. Well, what does that mean? That's 2,000 years ago. Because when Jesus' resurrection started, it was the beginning of the age to come. And so Christians believe we are actually sort of, there's the past age and there's the age to come, and Christians are right there in the middle. And the Apostle Paul talks about inwardly, we're already beginning to lean into the age to come, but our bodies are not there yet. After death, in the resurrection, we will then participate fully in the age to come in the renewal of all things. And so there's actually, you know, I, 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 part of part of being a preacher is figuring out, that's why I'm a gospel word gardener, because the gospel is this good news of the anticipated age to come, the hope for the age to come. And as a preacher, what I do is I'm always playing with words. And so actually, because I don't own words, words are part of a commons, I garden with words, because the words are long before me, and they have power. And so I, what does a gardener do? A gardener doesn't really give life or bring life. The gardener sort of shapes and molds. And so I put that at the top of my blog years ago. And not everybody finds it. I have it on my Twitter handle too. And people read it sometimes and like, 
gospel gardener of the age, you know, word gardener of the age to come. What does that mean? Well, it, I, as a pastor, I love those kind of moments in people because now they have a question or maybe they just scoff, which is fine. Too. But uh, that's, that, that's part of what pastors do. Well, the way you describe it, it brings to mind um, like you're cultivating the good word. In people's lives and in people's imaginations. That's that that is my job. Kind of like you're giving the gift of a question, like you're forcing someone to think about it a little bit more. That's right. Which is about all you can do, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for myself personally, I don't even know what to say, Paul. I really am glad that we're having this conversation. You're probably the closest I've been to the church in 20 years. Um, I've grown up in a small town that has a lot of Catholicism and Christianity around. We've got the Jesuit uh, shrine over in Midland that honors the saints that came to this area. We've got St. Marie among the Hurons. So there's a lot of history of sort of the church's exploitations into the Western world. And I've always just sort of been Christianity adjacent, I think would be the way to describe it. I don't have any qualms with the good book or the people that follow it, but it's just, I've never been able to attach. But then of course, Jordan Peterson came into our lives and I thought, wow, I, I actually don't know anything that's inside of the pages of this book. And so we've started reading it and I, it's been a demystifying process and it's, it's nice to get the conversations going, but I just, I I'm excited to see where it goes. I have no idea where it's going though. What have you, I'm, I'm curious as a pastor, I have the problem often of working with people who have a, I call it a faux familiarity with the Bible that because they, because they consider themselves Christian and identify as Christian. And because if as a Christian, you would say something like, well, I don't know what's in the Bible, you lose status. So they're sort of like the kids that go to school who didn't really do the assignment very well, but when they get to class, they act like they all know it because they don't want the teacher to call on them. That's a very common dynamic in church. So uh, I'm, I'm really curious about I was, you know, I was, when I heard what you guys were doing with the Bible, I'm really curious about the kinds of things that you found and the kinds of thoughts that you had about what you found, because as a preacher, those kinds of insights are really golden because I, again, being a pre being a minister is sort of like being a teacher of a classroom who is sort of faking it. And we kinda, so we kind of, we kind of had this exact same conversation the other day going over the odyssey and like kind of just to step aside because we were saying like the amount of people who you know know the odyssey and understand where it comes from that's that's everybody the amount of people that have read the odyssey that's a very minute few so it's it's hard to square those two things like, do you care about history and mythology and haven't read the Odyssey? Are you a Christian and haven't read the Bible? Like for ourselves, we haven't gotten through the Bible yet. We're still in the Old, the Old Testament. I think the next book we're on is First Chronicles. So we haven't really gotten into the, the Christian part of it. But it's been really interesting exploring all of the Old Testament and how they viewed all these things. And I've been reading Dr. Isaac Asimov's Guide to the Bible along with it, too, just to help track and get a little bit more information. And then, like, the Bible Project on YouTube, all of your stuff, it, it's all pretty useful. But I don't know if I have a, a really good understanding or grasp of it just yet. I think the Odyssey is a great illustration of the dynamic because you can find... You know, you can find children's books of the Odyssey. You can find how many different attempts to make the Odyssey intelligible to modern readers. The Simpsons, the first episode of The <laughs> Simpsons ever written was called Homer's Odyssey. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. It was the third one aired, but it was the first one ever written. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll have to look it up. So, but that's exactly the same issue with the Bible because the Bible is very strange, and most Christians will pick up a a modern translation. I've got dozens of them here. A modern translation of the you. Bible. Yeah, <laughs> and and they'll read it, and but they're reading it through a certain filter. Yeah, and it's usually you know Christians, let's say, who read the Bible for devotions will think at least for many of the Christians that I work with, they'll be like, okay, I need something from God today. I need a little pick me up. I need a little inspiration. I need a little, I need a little guidance in my life. And so they'll open the Bible and they'll read a passage and look for that. And usually if you look for something, you'll find it uh, good, bad, right or wrong. And so that's how they use the Bible. But the Bible is an ancient book written in cultures very different from our own and has been used and commented on nearly continuously all the way through and all of that builds around it and so it's it's a big big deal and so again it's it's sort of i mean meeting you guys is sort of like i don't know meeting a meeting a virgin in a brothel because <laughs> it's like Oh, wow. Well, what are you seeing? Because, of course, everyone who lives in the brothel, they've all seen it all. And, and, and you guys are just there with fresh eyes. And so for me, it's like I'm sort of the madam, I guess, and saying, well, what are what are what are you finding in our um, in our hall of pleasures? So as a book club, you know, we're reading these different books and I believe we're all reading the Bible objectively. And I was kind of curious too about what your opinion was as a, as a religious leader, you know, for people who are non-theists reading a religious text objectively. Is that um, blasphemy? Is it... Um... What do you mean by objectively? Yeah, are you talking so about Ayn Rand, or are you talking about what are you talking about? <laughs> so personally, I'm just reading through the text. I used to be a religious person. I grew up in a, a Baptist family. Um, you know, never went through a, a baptism, but I, I went to a Christian school and was, uh, you know, in in the church uh, to say to say that, but. Then when I was a teenager, maybe around 18, kind of fell out of that scene. Um, I would still have some Christian friends, but I I just stopped identifying with it and, and, and didn't feel like a close uh, warmth to a God figure. And at the same time, I started picking up like transcendental meditation and doing yoga. And I started getting these um, feelings similar to prayer where you're you're very centered and focused and you feel light on your feet um and so now i had never read through the whole bible you know we had just done sunday school things and, and you know, looked at a couple passages but it seemed in retrospect kind of cherry picked we didn't really look at some of the more uh, magical or um gruesome things that that happened in the bible and so now I'm just reading it objectively. I think the rest of our book club is too, just, you know, taking it for the word that we see it and not assigning it like a divine inspiration, if that makes sense. Okay. And, yeah. and so I guess the, the question I had earlier, is that okay to read a religious text like this from an objective perspective without fully investing in it? I, I would hope so. Because I think, quite frankly, if you're reading the Odyssey, there's exactly the same dynamics. I mean, we, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've read any of the, the work of Tom Holland, but he is, you know, he's a, he's a histor historian slash novelist who has been, you know, he just recently wrote a translation of Herodotus, which is, which I'm reading, which is quite fun. But you know, for an ancient person, this this I mean, one of Tom Holland's theses, which I think is correct, is that this this idea of the secular, this idea of the objective, 
is actually a Christian invention. And for a Greek, you know, any reading you do is religious. It's just a question of where you stand in the religious world. So I, I, I don't have, you know, every, any time I would read Homer or any ancient person, there's exactly the same issue involved because the, I mean, we are so completely accustomed to the philosophical framing that we are an individual standing apart from a text, completely losing the idea that, well, what is happening in that text? Well, here an ancient person is somehow speaking to you. Well, that sounds awfully magic. And mm -hmm. so we, we always read where there, there's always a, a very complex, mysterious interchange happening whenever we read anything. And that's especially true when we're looking at something from the ancient world, even if let's say you decide, you know, we're as a book club, we're going to, we're going to be more serious than, than almost every other book club around. Y'all are going to learn Greek and y'all are going to try your best to read Homer in the Greek. Okay. That would be a really cool project. Well, Will now, gave it his best effort. Conversations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You, the next thing you're going to have to recognize is that up until the invention of the printing press, and even after it to a degree, all of those texts that you're interacting with have their own histories. Mm. And if I pull, let's say, I only have certain books within arm's reach here. If I pull a copy of the, the Greek text of the New Testament off the shelf, there has been worlds of scholarship that has gone into the development of just that book because there are all these manuscripts and all of these renderings. And so all of that is in there. And, and we, you know, my point is that the, what we assume to be this very direct process is by no means that direct and that there are you know, many years and many scholars and much work that has gone on between you and that text. And so, no, I, I think it's the, the Bible is the most published, the most chewed on, the most commented on book in all of human history. And there's not even anything second, the most, the second most printed book in human history is Mao's Little Red Book. That's the second most printed book in all of human history. It's not the Quran. Um, you know, because part of which is because, again, for if you were taught to talk to a Muslim and say, OK, we're reading the Quran, they'd probably say, no, you're not, because mm. you you haven't mm. learned Arabic. You can only read the Quran if you read Arabic. And if you look at, say, Northrop Fry's, he has this video series on the Bible from uh, that you can find on the University of Toronto's website. One of the first points Northrop Frye makes is that in Christianity, it's um, Christianity is read in translation, which is a point that most modern people just completely goes over their head. But every ancient person would understand that if you're reading a text in translation, there is a world of assumptions that have been brought to you that says, this is a gift from me to you. You would honor me if you would read it at all. So um, there's there's actually a, a ton in there. That's, the Jewish that's going tradition, on here. The Jewish tradition has something similar too, right? Where like the Orthodox Jew would say, "You're not reading the Torah unless it's in the ancient Hebrew." That's right. Yeah. We talk, it's, it's very common. Nietzsche had the same point about reading anything that was translated by anyone from any language, but. Yeah. Like for me, just to speak to the objectivity point, I don't think objective is the word I'd use. I think almost skeptic, but not even quite skeptic. Cause like I'm, I'm open to reading the contents of this book, but like, you know, I look at something like this pillar of fire that guided the people in the desert for 40 years. I'm like, I don't know how accurate that is. But the big thing for me is like growing up, I watched Veggie Tales. So when I started reading the Old Testament, first of all, there were no Asparagus. 
and it wasn't even really about Christians. <laughs> and I had no idea. <laughs> Where's the asparagus? <laughs> like, I, I had no idea who David was in the story of David and Goliath until yeah. last month. <laughs> Well, I, and I'm dying to know, I, what did you think? Because to me, I've, you know, as a pastor, so I go over these stories regularly. And I, even though I learned them in Sunday school, and and as, again, often when they're taught to children, they're sort of, you know, even if you're reading them in the Bible and you're a child, a lot of it goes over your head. And if you were to go back and watch Veggie Tales again now, you'd see, <laughs> oh, there's a lot of little jokes going on in the midst of it for the adults. The kids are just watching vegetables, but the adults are seeing <laughs> more into it. So I'm I'm really curious about your impressions of of David and and Saul and what you think is going on in those stories. Because again, for me as a pastor. That's huge because part of my congregation is sort of faking it, you know, faking the homework in class. But there's others who, so recently we had someone come into our church and he came in through the Jordan Peterson stuff and he was helping me with stuff. So he was there every week. And, you know, he basically at some point had to admit, he said, you know, I have no idea what is going on here. You know, you all are talking and you're telling these stories and you're singing these songs, but. I have no idea what anything's ha what's going on here. And I thought, ha, huh, look, you know, an honest, an honest man in the whorehouse. Um, he's, <laughs> you know, an honest child in the whorehouse looks around. And it's like, I have no idea what all is going on. And that's, that's truth. So I'm really curious about what your guys' thoughts are. Well, there, I mean, there is definitely something meaningful going on at uh, church level. You know, you have a congregation of people coming together it feels good to be part of that group. Um, but reading through the Bible, you know, page by page, it, I feel like it's only made me more skeptical, like uh, Will mentioned. Um, that Why? What, what about it? I'm really curious. So I find myself drawn to the magical things. Like uh, in the book of Second Kings, you have Elijah performing all these miracles um and earlier on in the the uh like in the book of genesis where you have enoch who's taken away with god he disappears um you know there's countless number of uh what you could say magical acts though they're said to be the power of god and i guess i just find it that i don't believe those things happen even though I believe some of the things in the Bible are historical accounts, I kind of like find that the magical stuff is where I draw a line and say, there's no way these, uh, these happened. And is it, isn't it just taking from older religions, like the, the Greeks, the gods of the Greeks, where they did magical things and it's injected into this book. Um, did you but, have a similar experience when you were reading Homer? Um, no, I didn't. I actually had a hard time getting through Homer, the Odyssey. Really? Yeah. Man, I, really? I love Notice the Odyssey. I was Odyssey. not in the, the discussion on that book. All, um, all I did was make connections from everything when I read Homer, because like, I'm super into Greek mythology and religious beliefs in general, and we had we spent a good chunk of the last podcast just talking about rose fingered dawn rising up every morning. It's like, yeah, that's just the first line of every chapter for us. But for the Greeks, that was a God that chose to arise and give everybody their light every day. And they could just stop whenever they wanted to. So that's, that's a world that you have to consider being in whether it's objectively true or not in your own perspective it is true so my biggest thing going through the bible is just to put myself in the shoes of someone like i don't know like someone traveling from egypt to the promised land or like born 
during the exile or something like that like what would be going through their head when the only authority they know is Moses and then this invisible God that he claims to be the one true ruler over all of them sending them to the promised land like you can choose to trust that I guess but whether I mean, whether or not you can he, believe him or not I think is a different question you see, when I was uh, starting to get back into reading the Bible, um, like you said, Paul, there's it does have a filter. It does have a specific lens when you read it. So for me, when I got back into it and trying to understand everything that was going on, um, like our previous discussion in Second Kings, it was all about these different leaders who would rise and then they fall. And even going back to the story of Moses and just trying to understand what it all means. And for that story in particular, I came to the realization that uh, it's about leadership, essentially, and the principles that are added to that. So back then when I was a young lad and trying to uh, read the Bible and going to church every Sunday, um, I had a very hard time understanding it. And as a kid, you would, in a sense, have difficulty understanding it. And coming back to it as an adult now, it does unfold. Even though it's a bit mysterious, it's always good to ask, okay, does this apply to real life? Can I use this in my daily life? Or can I just say, okay, it's just a story and maybe in a sense it can be metaphorical i like i like where you're going with that pat like the whole the leadership thing and then you talk about some of the mystical stuff like that's going on in the desert with moses specifically because we haven't gotten to the new testament but it's like the lens i'm taking is like okay so assuming the laws of physics are real and god doesn't exist what would be the actual intent when you have to deal with a large group of people who have been following all sorts of deities and doing all sorts of crazy sacrifices, like if you know what their behaviors are and you can create a mythology that will lead them down the right path, then you start to look at these things that they're telling them to do. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you put God on the back burner and you say, well, this is going to help the people. Like when you look at them doing the raids into the promised land sending in spies like after reading the art of war it's like okay that, that makes sense this is completely effective and this is stratagem and it, it's just simple documentation and it was just really boring the majority of the time because they do maybe a few paragraphs of something interesting and then they'd reiterate the 2,000 people that they had with them <laughs> so it it like I didn't get hung up a lot on on the mystic side of things. And I think I've been really just kind of trying to cut through and say, okay, well, assuming Moses has his people's best interests in mind, what is he trying to achieve here? But now you're asking the question, did Moses believe the kind of things that he taught to his people himself? Because like, if you take that perspective, you're kind of assuming that he was, his only concern was getting his people out of the desert to the promised land not actually worshiping this god that he so preciously treasures it's almost like i see that as the means like the entire religion and community and everything all of the ceremony and ritual and the practices like that structure that's meaning and you give that to a large body of people alone in a desert and they don't feel so alone anymore and they can work together as a unit and like i do operate on the premise that everybody on this planet barring significant mental disorder operates from a place of good intention how that trickles out to actions and behaviors and beliefs is, is a whole other gamut but you reminded me of our very first bible episode on genesis when we were with matt because I think I asked the question, like, what does the Bible mean to you? And his answer was something along the lines of a source to draw liturgies from, like something to create a form of tradition and that holds the community together. 
So if that's what the Bible is for, then God is something else, right? <laughs> well, you know, what's part of what I think contemporary people struggle with is so so one of Tom Holland's lectures that he gives on the ancient world, which I often point to, it's on YouTube. The Greeks didn't have a word for religion. When we look at the Greeks, we say they're very religious. The Greeks didn't see themselves that way. This, this category of religion is actually something that is the product of something far later. When the British came to India, Hinduism was invented. Now you might say, how can you say that? Hinduism is an ancient religion. No, but it wasn't called a religion until the British came to India. What the people that we call Hindus were doing was living. And, you know, someone who would come to our world, let's say, so in the United States, you know, the attacks of 9-11, you know, for, you know, five or 10 years after those attacks, you would see bumper stickers that would show pictures of the World Trade Center, and they'd say, never forget. I've heard that and one before. <laughs> yeah. And you'd say, why? Oh, and then if you go to New York City, which, you know, um, you know, the south end of Manhattan is some of the most expensive real estate in all of the United States. And what they decided to do was carve out a certain amount of real estate and spend millions of dollars to create what someone in the ancient world would call a shrine. We don't call it a shrine. What do we call it? We call it a memorial. Well, why would you occupy multi-million dollar real estate and add millions on top of it and people would donate money to this cause in order to do exactly what? Have a place to go for people to cry? I can make someone cry by slapping them. No, but you don't understand. When they cry at the shrine, it means something different than if they cry because I just punched them in the nose. I said, but it's both crying. No, but you don't understand. And see, part of what's going on here is that there are all these layers to our activity that from the inside seems so reasonable. Well, of course we would develop a shrine in, well, we won't call it a shrine. Of course we will have the 9-11 memorial in the south end of, of Manhattan. We have to remember. Well, I don't see how remembering puts food on my table or gas in my tank or, um, you know, pays my power bill. In fact, it does the other. No, but if we lose that, we lose something of ourselves. Oh, well, what is that thing? And so part of what's difficult for us is that when we're and, and a lot of these conversations have gone on in for example a lot of the things that you notice when you're reading the bible is what's with all this repetition and if you're reading let's say for samuel one of the things you'll notice is david somehow mean you know meets saul twice you know what's what's that business with goliath and then you know what's you know what's the business with samuel sneaking out and finding Jesse and quizzing all of his sons. There's all of these questions that emerge from the text that we look at as this is very strange. Whereas, you know, someone, perhaps a Greek might come to lower, an ancient Greek might come to lower Manhattan and say, you're memorializing your failure. You're memorializing your loss. I mean, there should be a, there should be a celebratory, um, there should be a celebratory shrine in the caves of Afghanistan where they, you know, dominated you and destroyed the, the, the symbolic symbols of your economics and even attacked the heart of your military might. There's, that's where the, that's where the uh, memorial should be. And we look at that and we'd say, oh, if we found a shrine to 9-11 celebrating the death 
of all of the people that died at the World Trade Centers. We'd send soldiers over there to destroy it. Oh, so now, now we have a sense of the wavelength that that really moves history. I mean, a lot of people say that, well, the second Gulf War happened because why? Because after the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein had notions of, you know, you know, didn't really like what George Bush Sr. did, so he's going to go and assassinate him. And so young George Bush says, you know, you did this to my father. Well, you thought about doing this to my father? I'll show you. And, you know, and you read, you know, let's say the Iliad, and how dare those Trojans, you know, off with Helen. And, you know, but of course, what's happening in the Iliad is all of the gods are involved. But what exactly are those gods? Are those gods any different from the things that motivated us to make a shrine in Manhattan? Or an ancient Greek would have said Osama bin Laden should have celebrated in the in the caves of Tora Bora. So there's a lot going on here that Almost every culture is blind to their own religion, but the religions of other cultures seem abundantly odd and strange, but obvious to us. Yeah, I have a good present day example of that, because if you look at the religious stats for Japan, I've been doing a little bit of research on Shintoism and like that's the most popular religion in Japan to us. But if you go to Japan... They don't know what the word Shinto means. They all call themselves Buddhists when they refer to religion. But when you see all of these Shinto shrines and everything everywhere, you're like, well, but what is this? And they just say, that, that's just a Japanese shrine. That's where we go to thank the kami. What are you talking about? That's not religion. It's, it's the exact same thing. They're just performing their own tradition, their own liturgy, the way they know how, the way they were brought up to do it and we assigned a label to it so it's which like, we say is a horrible thing to do <laughs> yeah it kind of the image in my head is like these when you were talking about like setting up a memorial in afghanistan the image that popped into my head was like we're all nodes in a network but this is what happens when two nodes start to misfire it's like no that's not okay that's we send soldiers now yeah it's just yeah. a, a disruption in the network why I would, go ahead i would dare even say you know like you look at some of the movements going on in the states you know and even in canada tearing down monuments and you know that's a crusade and there's a belief yeah. system at play and for a while i think we were calling it the church of woke right yeah. <laughs> it's like when you don't have religion in the way that you perceive it I think that there's this sort of unconscious thing that happens where you gravitate towards a, a set of behaviors and belief systems. However you put that hat on, I think that hat still finds its way onto your head. Put on a swastika yeah. and walk down the streets of Toronto and see how that goes. Say, I'd rather not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just lines. No, yeah. it's not just lines. <laughs> then you can make the argument, no, this is a symbol from Hinduism. You don't understand. Like, well, it looks like a swastika to me. <laughs> yeah. And well, the United it... States with the capital. I mean, you can't get a bigger example. Yeah. Yeah. Why is everyone like... so upset? People go in there every day. No, it's how they went in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A, a couple thoughts I was having on spirituality and religion with kind of touching on what Scott mentioned about Shintoism. Uh, from what I understand, they consider everything on earth and even the whole earth itself as some kind of uh, having as a uh, been imparted a spiritual essence. Uh, you could have a rock that uh, might be part of some God. You could have a river that has a God. And so you have this where everything is spiritual on one side. The other side of the coin is nothing is spiritual and kind of leads you to the uh, nihilistic viewpoint. Well, nothing matters. Why do we need to do anything? And I see religion uh, and churches, sanghas and Buddhism, um, synagogues as kind of the middle way where all the rules and the tenets are giving you a narrow path to walk on. 
And it's that narrow path that gives you, injects meaning in your life. Because if you fall off that path, all of a sudden you're in chaos. But if you stay on that path, it will lead you towards order. And uh, order is the goal. We're trying to fight off chaos. It's interesting you bring that up because I'm going through my yoga teacher training certification right now. And so one of the books that I, I'm reading is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And almost on the exact same page that they state all things on this planet are divine, that everything is an extension of this infinite grace that is behind all things. They tell me not to eat meat. Almost on the exact same page, they say only have a vegan diet. Also, God is everything. Don't eat meat. And it's just like you have this narrow path, but there's these blind spots and you're reading it. And it's like, how, how did you not see this? Like, this is a contradiction. <laughs> and it's funny because probably when, if you had gone, if you had gone into the yoga studio and saw the statuaries and said to someone, oh, I, I, I thought this was for exercise. I I'm not looking for a religion. What would they have said? Oh, it's oh, not this a religion. A religion. Oh, well, the statues, the 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 ancient texts, the practices. I mean, again, anybody who rushed into the Capitol on January six could probably have walked into the building on January five. With absolutely no problem at all. Why? What was different on January 6th from January 5? What actions? Well, they came in with flags. Oh, okay. Well, you know, they came in with, I mean, even, I mean, again, we're blind. We, we just say, well, it's completely obvious what happened on January 6th was totally different than what happened on January 5. Well, why? Well, you have sacred spaces. Well, what's the sacred space? Well, Nancy Pelosi's office, the lectern in the Senate chamber. Those are sacred spaces. Well, what makes them sacred? The the wood? Are they cut from a special tree? No. It's just cut from some lumber somewhere. What makes them sacred? Well, it's all around us. And it's just that Christianity remade the map so pervasively that you don't have to go to church to actually be downstream from the remaking of that map. And so that a yoga studio in a yoga studio in Toronto is seen through very different eyes from a yoga studio in Delhi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, yeah. Where does that difference reside? It's, it's funny it, you bring you know, that it's up. It's not in matter. Like, I'm following a podcast by a couple of ladies from India who came to America and went to get a yoga certification from a white woman <laughs> and were informed throughout each class that they were wrong about all of these things and all of these beliefs and all of these practices. The way they said the words that they learned in the tongue from their motherland was wrong. And it's like, it's this interpretation and it's this attachment to our interpretation. And like we label something and, you know, in this group, we can say, well, a label's a label's a label. It's just a nominalization. It doesn't change the way mustard tastes. But some people really think that the label is the thing and they get so attached to it to the point that if you attack their label, it's a direct attack on their own identity. Yeah, but did they share the same goals? You can't even get to goals when you're stuck identifying with labels and you know when you think that your yeah. your story or your emotions and you're stuck in defense mode you can't even talk about goals it, it all breaks down at that point this goes back to paul and i's first conversation on the tower of babel like if you're not able to do that first stage of translation what are you left with that's why religious people say you can't read the Bible in translation. You can't read the Torah or the or the Quran in translation because once you translate it, you lose it. I mean, there's a reason Plato had, you know, Plato of all people, you know, had some real second thoughts about written language. 
Yeah, the, le- the legend goes that like Plato wanted to write it down, but then Socrates was the one that said, no, don't write any of this down or you wouldn't be able to cultivate any memory at all. So like if you write this down, you're, it's a detriment to yourself. That's why we have no writing from Socrates and a lot of scholars today think he was just Plato's fictional character and him talking to himself in a new form of writing that people hadn't experienced before. And and we say things like, oh, that's just a label. Oh, okay. Well, let me throw a label at you and see if you re- respond. And all of us can think of the whole range of labels <laughs> that we can use to make yeah. someone, you know, this person is a racist. Okay, well, we can't hire a racist. Well, this person is a Nazi. Well, we can't hire. Na- well, they're just labels. No, they're not. <laughs> they're real <laughs> enough to change the world. Yeah. But we don't yeah. see our own labels because we're completely in the midst. And so then back to the other question, which is why I'm so fascinated by a group like yours is, okay, you're reading this book. What are you seeing? And um, I think it's if if you went to Sunday school as a child, what you see in this book will be very different than if you didn't by that experience of that you grew up in. And, you know, so someone, let's say, who, um, you know, is 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 from a different culture, they will read the book and they will see something fascinating. You know, if you read through the book of Genesis, one of the things and especially in, in a number of things in the Old Testament, you get into these genealogies, it's like, what are they doing? This is this is horrible. Or, you know, a common thing is Genesis has all these cool stories. First half of Exodus, you've got the plagues and then you've got Sinai. And then you start getting the furnishings of the tabernacle page yeah. after page. And it's like, what, 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 who would who would write this down? What, how is this sacred? You know, people, when they have their devotions at night, Lord, speak to me. And they open up to the furnishings of the tabernacle. And it's like, what is this for? You go to people of other cultures, they're like, oh, now it's getting interesting because um, this is the this is the power that moves the world. No, we just think it's furniture. Unless, of course, someone is tropsing out of the Capitol building with Nancy Pelosi's lectern. Oh, that's just furniture. Oh, no, it isn't. Look at what it's connected to. Yeah, when you see someone leave the Capitol building with the podium, he didn't just steal a piece of wood. That's that's a symbol. That's like when a rival football team comes in and steals the mascot or, you know, the Philistines roll in and, you know, burn down their monuments to Yahweh, whatever it is. That's, that's exactly right. And it's so, and so then we, I mean, we, and then to add another layer of this, we think we can, so you go to a yoga studio and you do yoga teacher training and it's like, well, why do you want to do this? Well, I want to be healthy. Okay, good. Well, you can go to a gym. No, but this is different. Well, how? Well, this is more meaningful. Well, why? And so some people would say, well, if you're doing down dog in front of that statue, how is that different from being in the temple of Dagon and bowing down in front of that statue? What's the relationship between these two worlds? So other people, go ahead. I might be able to touch on this a little bit. I, I too, was a yoga instructor and one of the the labels, uh, we think of them as ideas. So one of the ideas in Eastern religions um, is that we ourself are divine creatures. And so when we're doing yoga, we're almost praying to ourself. Uh, we're, we're worshiping ourselves, but at the same time realizing we're, we have to be humble and, and not put ourselves up on some kind of pedestal uh, where we see ourselves as you know the most important thing. But from the yogi's perspective, they do see their self as a divine entity and it's the breath it is kind of like the fire, um, the pneuma that is coursing through your body. Um, from the Christian perspective, I've heard it said that, you know, we are not divine creatures. We are 
humans, we have fallen, and God is divine. So I think it just comes down to ideas and, you know, how we subjectively see ourselves in a relation. You know, I wouldn't say that yogis would say, you know, I am God, but I know a lot of them feel like they are part of God. And it's going to the the yoga studio or going to the meditation center or going to the church that gives them the sense of meaning, even if they don't identify with all of the other tenets of, um, like if you were a Buddhist, you could go to the Sangha, you could chant, you can meditate, even if you don't necessarily follow the eightfold path to the T. Um, and, I'm kind of curious from your perspective as a pastor, somebody taking on the approach on a superficial level where you're just going for the community aspect. Uh, you know, what is your opinion on that? If they don't buy into the full um, reincarnation or uh, providence of heaven, you know, is that okay that they're just there for the, uh, the humanity, uh, the singing and, and congregation? I guess my my point my point in all of this is that we we are funny creatures with what we take seriously and what we don't. For example, if let's say I was raised in the you know the hills of Arkansas, or you guys are from Texas, you know the South better than I do. Um, someone says, I, I really just I really just go to the Klan meetings because all my friends are there. And the cross burning, you know, that's that's sort of an archaic thing. And the hoods and the chanting and the songs, you know, we don't we don't we don't actually lynch anybody. Nobody nobody's actually hurt by our clan meetings. And and I don't really think my clan meeting is religious at all. That just because that's a cross that we burn, that doesn't really mean anything. And we've actually never as a group, we've never torched a, a church. We've never burned it. We only burn a cross on Bubba's farm over there. And it's Bubba's farm, and he's part of the clan, so, and we have really good barbecue. Now, again, in our culture, you don't get a pass for that. That's, <laughs> you just that's, going, don't. that's going a little from culture to the area of cult, though, if we're going to be completely fair. <laughs> but is that any less objectively religious than a yoga studio? Hmm. or more religious because the question is category yeah like i think and that's the reason that the capitol building is sacred right because it's not the building and it's not the actions but it's the repetition and it's the how and it's the who and it's the for how long and how <laughs> consistently that structure we get back to structure and it's like divine well, and I, yeah. I will ask some people sometimes, I'll say, is Uncle Sam real? And people will say, I would say, it's Uncle, Uncle Sam is real enough that you pay your taxes to him and you send your sons to die in service of him. And you have feels and emotions when Uncle Sam's symbols and songs are played in groups and you sing them together uncle sam is very real indeed even if you can't go and lay your hands on this tall guy with a big white beard and a you know a stovepipe hat with the stars and stripes on it but uncle sam is very real indeed but yeah. in what ah. realm is uncle sam real and what are what is what is real is yeah. real that which shapes and moves the world? Uncle Sam was real enough to, you know, have to wage war in Afghanistan for the last. How, how, how long have we been in Afghanistan? 20 years depends, now? Yeah, 20 depends years. Depends when you start counting. Yeah. <laughs> so this is yeah. this is where this is where these conversations and questions get get really interesting because from a materialist perspective, you would say that, well, these are these are thoughts and ideas, and they are all dependent upon, you know, our cognitive matter 
and and they're finally derivative and not you know not finally important but then when we use a word like divine and you're exactly right in a if you go to yoga teacher training and they say you know everything is divine okay but then why aren't are some things more divine than others and so we can eat plants but not meat isn't isn't the same divinity in a plant as in meat? Um, what's where's a hierarchy here? And you know, and and these conversations. I mean, again, the the deep Protestantism in our cultures is so abundantly evident that for many people, food and religion have been divorced for such a long time that we don't even pay attention to it. But if you go into the ancient world religious prescriptions are all about symbolism and foods and bodily poses and all of those things but we don't look at it that way and so religious texts well that's 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 just part of the whole package yeah i have a big problem with the way people use the word real these days it's another one of those words that fudge you know <laughs> Because the example that I always bring up, well, another one, Akira the Dawn's wave. Obviously, Santa Claus exists, featuring Jonathan Pajot. And the other one is, like, just in the example of dreams. Like, I always used to be, like, I always used to read these stories and feel ripped off when it ended with, and then he woke up. I was like, ah, oh, none of it was real. But then... I read a comic series called The Sandman by Neil Gaiman, and it completely flipped my perception of what a dream is. Because yeah. it's like, you can, you can have a dream about something that you wake up and it changes your life forever. Was that experience real? Or in one of the last Harry Potter movies where Harry has this vision where he meets Dumbledore and at the end he asks him, was this all real or was it just in my head? Well, of course it was in your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean it wasn't real? Like it's, it's these kind of things. Like you have to really ask yourself, what do you mean by real? If it happened to you, did you experience it? Did you participate in it? It's real. Even if it's not real for your neighbor or your spouse or your brothers and family, whatever. It can be real for you and not for other people. Two things can be true <clears throat> at the same time. It's funny you bring up Santa because I was literally just in my head thinking about that after that Uncle Sam concept. It was like, well, Santa Claus was real briefly. For like a good nine years, he was he was real. <laughs> like, And then I decided he wasn't anymore, just like most kids do. But it's like the brain does not differentiate between reality and imagination. You can imagine yourself walking into your kitchen and eating a lemon and you will start to salivate. And that's like hypnosis taught me that. And so how can you define boundaries on existence and experience just based on perception that we all share? Like, it seems a little arbitrary at that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so one of the ways I think about, uh, you know, what is real, what is reality is we, we have thoughts, which are kind of on this border of they're not real, they haven't manifested yet. It, it's, it's a thought in our head, an idea. And then when we apply action to that thought, let's say, I, I could think I, I love my wife, but then it's not until the action of me you know, giving her a hug or a kiss or rubbing her feet, that it actually becomes real. Um, in, in Zen Buddhism, they say thoughts are just thoughts. They, they're subliminal. They're, they don't have any, any bearing on reality until you act. So if you are feeling angry at somebody, you know, it's just a thought. But the second you start frowning, and giving them the evil eye, then all of a sudden it's real. Um, with perceptions, it, it, it becomes real when, when the environment is reacting with your body. And, and so if you're feeling pain because you've been stabbed, you can say that's real. 
versus somebody who maybe has lost a limb and they have phantom pain, the doctor can't say, well, we don't know why you're having pain. It, it's just, uh, I don't think they use the word unreal, but it, it's, they say it's in your head. I think that's real. We, we all can quite easily have the idea of more real and less real. Uncle Sam is very real if he's invading your country. If the United States found some legitimacy or justification to invade Canada, mm -hmm. um, you all would say uncles are, you know, and troops from te troops from Texas invaded Toronto. Um, hey, my buddy, <laughs> I'm going to bill it at your house. <laughs> Do you mind? <laughs> so there's always more real and less real. And I think one way to think about this, as you've said, is that the more layers of instantiation something takes on, the more real it is. And that also works through time. And so something is very real if it has endured a lot of time. So in that way, Uncle Sam is quite real, but Santa Claus is even more real because Santa Claus has endured more time than Uncle Sam. Uh, Santa Claus instantiates in shopping malls, in greeting cards, Uncle Sam instantiates in buildings and traditions. And, and so then we, then we might ask, well, kind of do a, um, an ontological argument. Well, what is most real? Well, the thing that is most real is the thing that instantiates at, at the most levels and for the most time. And, and you've almost, you've almost approximated something, an idea that we would say something like eternity, which would be the most real. But, you know, part of where this, an example, so part of what I'm doing on my, just in my own thinking, in my own evolution through these last three years is to try to, to get a handle on what we mean by this word spiritual. Because as a pastor, you know, I sit there and, and we're reading something in the Bible together and, and there's, a, there's a degree of dissonance. And so someone basically says, well, that's spiritually true. And so again, you have the, the classroom dynamic where now they've said this, now they've said the secret sacred word that's spiritually true. And everybody in church goes like this. Okay. That's spiritually true. And so now I'm the jerk who stops them and says, uh, what do you mean by spiritually true? And then they look at me like the kids who haven't really done their homework. Like, I hope he doesn't call on me because and, and so one of the illustrations I've been using lately is the idea of school spirit, because we all have a sense of what school spirit is. And school spirit is both shaped by the architecture of the school and the location of the school, the neighborhood of the school, the ethnicity of the members of the student body and the faculty, the educational tradition of, and you can get the sense with school spirit that there are many spirits have come into that place to create school spirit. Um, nobody, nobody really controls school spirit. The administration tries, the cheerleaders try um, the school district tries, but school spirit is is something far larger than them. And if we get a sense of the subtleties and complexities of school spirit, we can we can begin to get a sense of what the spiritual world is made of and why when that person offed and then took a selfie of themselves with Nancy Pelosi's lectern, there's a lot of spirituality involved in that moment. There are centuries of it. And, well, he can go to jail for stealing that lectern. Whereas if he had on a capital tour a day or a month before gone in and saw Nancy Pelosi's lectern and quickly snuck back and got a selfie, everyone, you know, the security guard said, you know, get out of here. And, but you wouldn't go to jail. Oh, there are spiritual forces at work among us all the time. And, and to say, well, that's just, that's just thought. Uh, we take it way more seriously than that. And, and, and this is what we're dealing with when we read the Odyssey. And I love your illustration. You know, the sun comes up every day. Um, what, but, but that's just mechanism. Oh, so now we're knocking on the door of, of deism. 
because we got here through deism and well what is deism and so then you start doing the diagnosis and taking a part of why what, what what's the spiritual history of nancy pelosi's lectern and why do we all get excited about that so there's a lot going on here yeah i guess that's i guess that's the reason why i've been trying to figure out how these stories last for a long time how the bible lasts for a long time how does the odyssey last for a long time it's just those layers too and as somebody who's studied uh novel writing and just reading these books and, and by the way this is the reason why i joined the book wave podcast is because not only do i want to get a an understanding about how these books are structured how they present themselves but in a way how do they what what do they give me in return and um and we've read many books like crime and punishment and meditations and just dissecting each layer and understanding what the presentation is so that's what I've been trying to figure out, and I'm actually glad you brought that up, Paul. Your little speech about I, school I have to get out of here in 15 minutes because I yeah. have real people coming in for my day job. But um, I've been keeping an eye on the time here. Morning. Good, good. Yeah, yeah I was going to say we might not have enough time to get into some more um, deeper aspects of you know thought and action, but I was just kind of curious. We all created this book club as part of a, a common interest in a DJ, um, Akira the Dawn. You know, he's got Klaus and we call him the, <laughs> an artist and a DJ and a wave lord because of this uh, meaning wave. Um, he's our pastor of the Church he, of Meaning. <laughs> universe that he created, right. But um, I was curious, have you listened to some of Akira the Dawn's uh, songs or albums and if you had any uh, favorite ones. Uh, he, of course, he does the Jordan B. Peterson waves, Alan Watts waves, and numerous other um, songs. I haven't listened to enough to have a favorite. I have listened to some of them, the Jordan Peterson ones and the, some of the Jonathan Peugeot ones, So, but I haven't. Uh, it's 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 been kind of a mystery to me. I, I've been I've sort of again, it's it's I look at it and I don't what am I looking at? What's, <laughs> obviously, it's very real and it's very powerful, but you know that to me just that to me just reinforces another mystery here, which is that of music. I mean, music in Christian, especially in Protestant churches, is so important. Music I mean, is everything, as Jordan Peterson oh, would say. Oh, it, there are. I mean, in you won't you won't get protestants to admit this especially not pastors but in so many especially protestant mega churches it's all about the music i mean the sermon eh but people go for the music and churches if you have great music you can have thousands of people and millions of dollars if you have crappy music nobody cares what the pastor thinks or says um Kanye so, understands that for sure. You better believe me. <laughs> and, and look at that look at the music industry. It's enormous. And mm -hmm. what is this? Well, it's just vibrations in the air. Oh, okay. It's very real. <laughs> it's billions of dollars real for vibrations Film. in the air. Film yeah, scores have a deeper understanding too in, in movies too especially when they go along with the dialogue and the action. Oh, man. Yeah. Have you ever been watching a movie and the soundtrack is just completely wrong? And it's like, I, I'm sorry, I can't engage. You've, you've pushed me away. Why do you think Star Wars is so great? Like 80% of it is John Williams. It's the music, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot better than the dialogue. I, I'm wearing a Darth Vader I... shirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> You you do a, a recreation of the Star Wars theme on any instrument, and I will get shivers. Like it's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, but I want to ask you, Paul, before you head out, if you know we're reading the Bible, and you know we don't know what we think about God too well, what other books might you recommend us to read? 
what kinds of books? I mean, is your book club mostly about great? Is it kind of a great books club? Yeah, well, we have we have a few different kind of lines of thinking. We have one series that's called like books you might have read in high school, and we have other ones where it's just like classics from the 18th century and stuff like that. And of course, we're doing the Bible and all this ancient mythology that we want to get into. Well, yeah. you know, the big well, if you read books about books, I mean, that's that's a whole nother category. But I think the, you know, the, the most important book of the 20th century was The Lord of the Rings. And that sounds OK. That, <laughs> that's, I, know, I know people people get people don't know what to do with that. And, and The Lord of the Rings, you know, especially on this topic is exceedingly strange because what Tolkien does is basically write ancient mythology without religion because they're you know that world is strangely devoid of what tolkien knew the ancient world was full of and so and 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 what that world what that book has done though for people is in fact created a religious text but it's not seen as overtly religious. I mean, Star Wars is, is similar, Harry Potter. Any of the big franchises have deep religious elements to that. And of course, Jordan Star Peterson. Star Wars, Star Wars might out. be a little bit different on this because people call themselves Jedi as a religion. Like that's right. one of the leading growing religions in Australia right now is Jedi. And I could bring up another example that's unapologetically based on a science fiction novel, Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard, Birth Scientology. Yeah. They don't make, they don't pretend that that is real mythology. Like they say they believe it, but they all know in their heart of hearts, this was written by a broke science fiction author. <laughs> but Tolkien is different and i yeah. think you know for a lot I of the agree. work that i've done tolkien and lewis so john verveke you know he's another scholar out of university of toronto i mean he's he's used the term meaning crisis and i think he's right about that mm. and i to me tolkien and lewis were um they were into this meaning crisis before we were and they had to because they're both veterans of world war one and I've I've just been my daughter. So I I'll, I don't have any sons living at home. I have five kids. I have two daughters living at home right now. So we're watching a lot of female oriented TV. And like my my Gilmore wife and girls. Yeah, <laughs> Gilmore Girls. And we're doing Downton Abbey right now. And I'm I'm fascinated. My daughter's thrilled that I'm fascinated by it, but I'm fascinated by it because it's about at this point at the beginning of the 20th century, which is a key transition. It's sort of the the height and it's the it's the it's the pinnacle of modernity. And after World War One, modernity is all downhill. And we're now a hundred years after that. And these things move very slowly through the culture. But Downton Abbey is fascinating me because it's it's it, you've got this ancient world of lords and servants and it's all coming undone before their eyes and there's people right here in the middle of the transition and they don't know if they want it or don't want it and we're we're far deeper into that now except i think we're sort of at a different end because the world for the next hundred years is going to get significantly more religious but now we have eyes to see religion that we didn't have 500 years ago. And so when, when India is no longer a secular state, when we have a 1 billion plus nation that is that has a religion and takes it more seriously than the UK, that's going to sort of make, you know, Islamism, what we've seen in the Islamic world, look pretty small and they're next to another billion people in what is in some ways the most serious secular state which is you know what's left over of communism 
you know, we're we're coming into a world that none of us are prepared for, and it has everything to do with religion. And yeah. this, in the background of, we were all told religions are going to go away. No, they're coming back, and none of us are ready for what that looks like. Yeah, that makes me think a lot about Friedrich Nietzsche when he says, like, we broke religion, guys. Christianity isn't going to work anymore. God is dead. We broke it by asking too many questions. It's like we're finally starting to complete that circle and actively try to fix it again as a human population. But you mentioned uh, books about books, and I'm wondering if you've heard of this series here called The Imaginarium Geographica. This is book two called the red dragon book two book one is called here there be dragons and the two main characters in this book their names are john and jack but they're like eponyms of J.R.R. tolkien and c.s lewis so this author projects these authors as characters in his book as they go through like these magical fantasy adventures i've never heard of it the first, it's a series, and the first book is There Be Dragons? Here There Be Dragons. Here There Be Dragons. It's like it's like a nod to that old thing that you'd see on maps, where you like look at an old map, and it would say, Here There Be Dragons, just because yeah. they don't know what's over there. Like To them, the dragon represented mystery and chaos. And in this series, it's, no, there are actually dragons there. <laughs> but oh, this sounds interesting. The author wow. is James A. Owen, and he's also a comic book writer, so my buddy got got me into him. Any other closing thoughts from you guys? Well, Paul, I just wanted to personally thank you as part of you know the crew of the Book Wave for coming on um, and having these discussions with us. Uh, I know you have got to go. You have other important actions uh, that need attention, so uh, I'll turn it back to i guess you you want to tell the audience where i guess they can find out more about your causes my my youtube channel is just my name paul vanderclay with a k because ellis island thought that would be good um from my <laughs> great grandfather uh i'm twitter i'm paul vanderclay i'm just around so if you're interested in more i've got way more hours than any sane person should want to listen to on youtube <laughs> sure and the last question real easy what was the last book you read i am always reading way too many books at a time um right now i'm rereading uh, i'm 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 reading machu i'm trying to learn to say his name because i never studied france machu pajot's the language Matthew. of creation Matthew, uh, Matthew Peugeot, cool. Matthew Peugeot, the <laughs> language of creation, and I'm I'm doing a commentary of it right now on my YouTube channel because that book gets into a lot of this, but I think actually C.S. Lewis's one of the books that hardly anybody has read, uh, the discarded image. I've I've I'm on my second time through that, and I'm probably going to read the conclusion because Lewis watched this and paid careful attention to it. He read pretty much everything from the ancient world in the original language. He was just a, a brilliant, nerdy guy who survived World War I and had a really crazy life. But, He's kind um, of portrayed this, like that in this book, too. Yeah. He couldn't <laughs> drive. He didn't know how to drive. You know, he had this, he in all likelihood, had a sexual affair, uh, uh, you know, an S and M sexual affair with the mother of a World War One buddy that he promised to take care of. Yeah, he took care of her. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, but then becomes this. You know, gave up Christianity. His mother died when he was six. Gave up Christianity very young, and then meets Tolkien and some other people at at Oxford, and has to sort of choose between Hinduism and Christianity. And he can find sources of why he chose Christianity and not Hinduism, and then lives this crazy life. And this book is the last book that's published of his. And it's basically made up of some of his lectures where he's trying to get at what on earth has happened to us. It's sort of the literary counterpart to um, Charles Taylor's The Secular Age, where Charles Taylor tries to go through this stuff. There's another, there's another 
crazy book. You you Canadians, you sure are, you know, you're punching above your weight with a lot of these guys. So good good on you. <laughs> hey Scott, do you want to mention the the book where our book club's currently reading through? Uh well the next book that is coming up is gonna be The Wave by Todd, Todd Strasser. Strasser. Yeah. Yeah, this this one's really good actually. Another book huh. that I read in high school. From it's the sixties. Yeah, it's about a uh, a high school teacher who wants to teach his students about the Nazis. He shows them all a video, and a few of the students say, "How could this have happened? What, like, what actually went down where Germans thought that like this was okay?" So he decided to run a little experiment where he, in effect, made himself the dictator of this classroom and created a cult that got way out of hand and yeah and this based was, on a true story yeah it is it was sounds crazy. like it was fun too <laughs> <laughs> well i don't want to take more of your time paul thank you so much i am looking forward to our next chat about all sorts of things would you so now i've recorded this is this something you'd like me to share on my channel or i'd be happy to share of it course. i thought this was wonderful yeah, I'll share it on both. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, Excellent. thank you all, and yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to come back if you'd ever like me to come. And uh, this was this was terrific. Awesome, and awesome. until next thank time, may right. the force be with you. All right, <laughs> or equal to mass times acceleration. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs>